Okay, so I played Telephone Pictionary with my family, and we're going to go through and see who won. First up is Violet, and she starts her sheet off with this literary throwdown. I want to be a marshmallow chicken spaceship. Is she just packing the text with ideas for players to have fun drawing, or is this an earnest desire of hers? She hands the text to Priscilla, who draws this masterpiece. First off, she flawlessly captures the marshmallow, the chicken, and the spaceship in order, but also includes a young lady with a hand mirror, indicating that desire, that she wants these things for herself. But then she puts her hands over her heart. These are her hopes and dreams, people. She wants to be that marshmallow chicken spaceship. She folds the top and hands her drawing to Emma. Emma takes a look and writes, When I look at myself, I see a marshmallow space chicken. Okay, no argument here. It's clearly a person with severe body dysmorphia. Excellent. She folds the top and hands her text to Toby. Toby reads the marshmallow space chicken and does his best marshmallow, though it's a little elongated, because it's not jet puffed, it's rocket puffed, out the back there for your spaceship. He gives it chicken legs and a chicken head topped off with a space bubble helmet. Perfect. And it appears to be saying something. It says, backwards K-O-D. Cod, an ancient space chicken greeting. Cod. A marshmallow's cry for help. In space, no one can hear you. Cod. I also have to point out this front piece here, which I'm guessing is the tip of a marshmallow roasting stick. Which is hilarious, because that means this ship is rocketing down the stick on a crash course with whoever's holding it. Imagine trying to roast the perfect s'more only to wind up with a gooey pile of space chicken in your hand. Cog. So Toby folds the top and hands his drawing to Finn, who looks at that and writes, Tube with pole going into it with a chicken head and legs and a rocket butt. Okay, the marshmallow is the tube, the stick's a pole, and the rest totally checks out. I like how he definitely saw the chicken head, but decided to completely ignore the bubble helmet and the instantly recognizable chicken noise. Cod. Instead, he made sure to highlight the much more important tube with pole going into it. Great. Finn folds the top and hands his text to me. I just draw what I read, but I had a hard time drawing a tube with a pole going into it. Like, it broke me as an artist. So I wound up just strapping a tube to a pole, then popping heads and legs and a rocket butt on it. Bam, off it goes. So what started as, I want to be a marshmallow chicken spaceship, turned into a girl with body dysmorphia, turned into an actual marshmallow spaceship, turned into a rocket chicken pole strapped to a tube. This actually isn't too bad. If we were to title the last picture with the first text, this chicken spaceship could be loaded with a cargo tube full of marshmallows for delivery to the roosters camping on Mars. Though I don't know who would actually want to be this obviously tortured animal. I'm gonna call this a win for the team, so everyone gets one point, and since it's Violet's page, she gets two points. Pod. Next is Priscilla's page, and she writes, the turkey and spaghetti penguin loved playing with their balloon. Ooh, like Violet, she's also thinking about nonsense birds. This could be challenging for the next artist, which is Emma, who reads the text and draws this. A beautiful turkey in a top hat, holding a balloon in its beak. There is a penguin-like creature batting the balloon, with some kind of mess dripping down its back, forming a tail, which I believe is spaghetti and meatballs. And just to hammer it home that this is in fact a spaghetti penguin, we have a bowl of spaghetti and meatballs hovering in space with an arrow pointing to the spaghetti tail. Perfect. I can also see that it's slurping up a strand of spaghetti. Nice touch. But you can just make out on the turkey's hat that it says, turkey. I don't know, that may be a rule violation. If she's going through the trouble of labeling something, maybe spaghetti would have been a better choice here. Anyway, Emma folds the top and hands her drawing to young Toby. Young Toby takes a long look at everything going on here, and all he can get out is this a platypus wearing a hat. Now, I would say the spaghetti penguin looks more like a platypus, but it's not wearing a hat, so he's clearly talking about the turkey. Maybe he thought Emma's tail feathers looked more like a beaver tail? Anyway, no mention of the balloon, penguin, or the bowl of meatballs, just a platypus wearing a hat. That's fine. He folds the top and hands his text to Finn. Now, Finn knows exactly what a platypus wearing a hat looks like. Boom. He's seen it a million times. That's Perry the platypus. Perfect. He folds and hands it to me. So to me, that's also clearly Perry the platypus, but I can't just write that. It's too easy. We'll just end up with the same picture. So I think I'm being really clever when I write 
All the human characters from Phineas and Ferb have been turned invisible. It fits Finn's picture, and I hand it to Violet, thinking, good luck drawing a bunch of invisible people. And she draws this. Curse you, Perry the Platypus! Damn it, she got me. So what started as the turkey and spaghetti penguin loved playing with their balloon, became a bowl of meatballs, became a platypus wearing a hat, became a platypus without a hat, or a balloon, or a turkey, or a spaghetti penguin. Ouch. If we were to title the last picture with the first text, it would be a portrait in schizophrenia. I'm going to award one point to Violet for easily deflecting my Phineas and Ferb foil, which puts her in an early lead. There's a hundred and four cog. Next is Emma's page, and she writes Tim Button style face. Now, I think she meant Tim Burton style face, but she didn't quite get the spelling right, so it says Tim Button style face, and she then passes it to Toby, who definitely doesn't know yet who Tim Burton is, and even if he did, he might think he doesn't know who Tim Button is, and he'd be right. So all he really has to go on is the smiley face she drew there next to her text. I'm not sure if emojis are allowed in the writing. We'll ask the judges later. But that smiley face is really all young Toby can relate to, so he draws this terrifying picture. It's clear he started with smiley face and figures that Tim Button is dead, so he X's out the eyes and then... Starting at the nose, it looks like he bisects the body of Tim Button. Is he performing an autopsy? I don't know, but he uncovers the chest cavities, showing tiny dead bodies, which have apparently been stabbed by twin knife murderers. Are these clues to the death of Tim Button? And then further down is a groin cavity that has some more bodies and the knife that maybe has done the actual bisection. I don't know if Tim Button is a mannequin for training medical examiners or a straight up serial killer. Either way, Toby, proud of his deeply disturbing knowledge of who Tim Button is, passes the picture to Finn. Finn studies this and writes, Dead naked lady with murder scenes on her bra and underwear. That's a pretty good guess. That could be a bikini. Those could be Toby's renderings of boobs, and the print on the swimsuit fabric just happens to be murder scenes. Sure, that's as good a guess as any. Better than famous serial killer Tim Button. So Finn hands his text to me. I'm drawing the best I can here. It's a tough order. Dead naked lady with murder scenes on her bra and underwear. Not fully naked, thank goodness, but I tried my best to get the murder scenes on both the bra and the panties, and I hand this to my daughter Violet. And Violet writes, A dead man-woman with a giant chest wearing a bikini with an illustration of a man slaughtering a woman. Now, this is pretty faithful. The only confusing part is a dead man-woman, but that's on me, because I realize there's a little extra bulge in the bottom, so we don't know if it's a man or woman wearing the murder bikini. We can't tell. So Violet hands it to Priscilla, who does a beautiful illustration of a dead man-woman. Now, I'm not certain how this man-woman is supposed to be dead, but it does have a giant chest, and it's wearing a bikini, and holding an illustration of a man slaughtering a woman. Perfect. So what started as Tim Button style face became the autopsy from hell, became a dead naked lady with murder underwear, became a living man woman bodybuilder holding a poster of a stabbing. So not great people. Very unfortunate that every illustration featured someone getting stabbed. There's a lot of room for improvement here. If we were to title the last picture with the first text, it would take hours of therapy to get to the bottom of. But I will give one point to Toby for his best guess at what a Tim Button style face would look like. I wouldn't have thought of that. There's a hundred and four cog. Next is young Toby. He wanted us to draw the graph striped Tig. So I don't know exactly what he was going for. He's still learning to spell. My guess is he meant a tiger with a giraffe's coat pattern, which is an excellent submission. But he wrote the graph striped Tig and passed it to his brother Finn. And this is what Finn interpreted it as. Uh, you can see that there's people throwing money at a giraffe on a stripper pole, so maybe he thought that said the giraffe stripped tightly? I don't know what he was thinking for Tig, but he clearly wanted to draw a giraffe stripper, so that's what I got when he handed it to me. I saw that he was drawing a giraffe, so I said, okay, well, I don't really want this to be about strippers, so I'm going to try to deflect it a little bit and say, throwing money at the giraffe in a swimsuit. Pretty accurate. You know, it could be a successful business giraffe selling tree logs on a hot day. And then I pass it to Violet. Violet says, throwing money at the giraffe in a swimsuit looks like this. 
Perfect. We have a guy throwing money, and the giraffe is on the beach, not at the strip bar. Mission accomplished. She hands it to Priscilla. Priscilla thinks it looks like me, so she says, Dad spent all his money on a fancy llama with an umbrella, and now he is sad. Yes, I do look sad, if that is indeed me, but this person has short hair, so I guess that's how she remembers me when I had short hair. Sad and penniless, which is accurate. So when she passes this to Emma, Emma simply draws me with long hair and what looks to be an erection, throwing money at a llama with an umbrella who is now back on a stripper pole. So it's pretty amazing that there is no mention of strippers at all in this text, but dad spent all of his money on a fancy llama. I guess Emma thinks that a fancy llama is one that dances for loose change, and I am apparently sexually excited by that, so there I am, throwing all my money, very sad, but nonetheless turned on by the fancy llama. And is it spitting or yelling? I don't know. What started as the graph striped tig turned into a stripping giraffe, which became a man on the beach without an erection, which turned into me with an erection throwing my money at a llama stripper. So I'm going to submit that did not translate well. However, if we were to title the last picture with the first text, the graph striped tig is so open to interpretation that it works just fine in my opinion. What's notable here is that Emma somehow detected the stripper pole from Finn's illustration. So I will award her one point for prop continuity. There's a hundred and four cog. Next is Finn's page. He wrote his text and handed it to me, and I think he was trying to get a rise out of me because he wrote, Ellie humping a dead baby. Now, Ellie is our family dog, and this is a joke in poor taste, but as a father, I know that I have to pick my battles, and getting them all to the table for a family game was enough of a battle for that hour. So, knowing that Finn gives me plenty of opportunities to explain the dangers of jokes made in poor taste, I decided to just put a pin in it, and I drew this. Not my proudest moment as a father, but I did try to deflect a little bit for the next player, while staying true to the central idea. I have Ellie, our chocolate lab, with a dead baby. I have an onlooker pointing to the travesty in horror, because it's a horrible thing. And I have a dog catcher there, trying to put a stop to what is happening. I felt that the faces of anger and horror really captured my disapproval of the text, and that was enough pushback for the time being. So I handed it off to Violet, who wrote, A scarecrow points at a vampire fishing for a dog holding a dead baby. This is excellent. That definitely could be a horrified scarecrow. That could be a fishing net instead of a dog net. She mistakes my sharp-toothed, bald dog catcher for a vampire, but that makes sense with Nosferatu. So this is accurate, and she hands it off to Priscilla. And Priscilla is pretty faithful. There you see a scarecrow pointing to a vampire who's fishing for a dog holding a dead baby. Perfect! And I love how calm this vampire is. He is just relaxing. This is a normal fishing trip for him, just trying to catch a dead baby-eating doggy. And the dog appears to be very sad, which is an important addition because dead babies are very sad. I think Finn was going through a dead baby joke phase at the time, and Ellie was also going through a humping things phase at the time, so it was kind of a perfect storm for this idea. But Priscilla then hands her picture to Emma, who writes, A vampire fishing in a cornfield using Ellie to find dead people while she cries. Perfect. Somehow Emma saw that this is not just any dog carrying the dead baby, this is Ellie. The family dog, retrieving a corpse, and the scarecrow suggests a cornfield. Great! So then Emma hands it to Toby, and he draws what looks to be an even more relaxed vampire. He's got his hands behind his head, just kicking back, fishing, just not a care in the world. Even though he's being approached by what looks to be a duck with wheels, holding a skeleton in its beak. So we went from Ellie humping a dead baby, to a sad dog in a cornfield, to a relaxed vampire fishing for a duck with wheels. Although not a perfect translation, it's a success in that we took something atrocious and turned it into something relatively benign. But if we titled the last picture with the first text, there would be many more questions than answers. Nice try, everybody. I'm going to give one point to Priscilla for adding Ellie's teardrop to her masterpiece. It's a tear of sorrow and regret, which I should have added to my bad dog. <laughs> There's a hundred and four cog. Okay, with Violet in the lead and Toby, Emma, and Priscilla tied at two, we have the final page, which is mine. I had Violet next to me, and I really wanted to give her a tough one, so I wrote, 
A clown trying to switch skeletons with a firefighter. Yeah, that could be hard. Why would it do that? How would it do that? Let's see. I hand it to Violet and she drew this. Definitely skeletons, yep. It could be a clown there with the poofy hair. And there could be a firefighter helmet there, maybe. Their skeletons are overlapping, so that's pretty good. Violet hands that picture to Priscilla. And Priscilla thinks that the poofy hair could be Violet, so she writes, Violet and Finn don't have any skin. Hmm, yes dear, I suppose you could make the case that those are the flayed remains of two of your children. She hands that text to Emma, who draws what she thinks Violet and Finn look like without skin. For Finn, she puts a gun in his hand, and she makes Violet think of a horse zip. Um, there's a man coming out of a horse costume, and the other guy has fallen down dead. Or is that a horse costume that's puking on a dead person? I don't know how that's supposed to translate as skinless Violet, but she hands that picture to Toby. Young Toby is so distraught by this illustration that he can't even write down what he thinks it is. So he has mom write it for him because that's Priscilla's handwriting. And he whispers into her ear, a weird lady thinking about a person holding a knife and a dead person. So apparently skinless Violet is the weird lady thinking about, I don't see a knife there. Maybe that person is stabbed. Maybe Toby is suffering from visions of Tim Button. Well, no mention of the horse or the skinless boy waving a gun, but Toby hands that description to Finn, and Finn reads Weird Lady and draws this. A woman with her bra half exposing her breasts, taking heroin and prescription pills, thinking about a person holding a knife and a dead person. Okay, that's pretty good. So what started with a clown trying to switch skeletons with a firefighter became skinless people, became one half topless lady doing drugs and contemplating murder. Not a great translation. If we titled the last picture with the first text, it's a pretty potent metaphor for the dangers of hard drug use, but still a lot of room to improve here. We can do better. I'm gonna give one point to Emma for whatever skinless Violet is thinking there. Did a two-person pantomime horse costume throw up one of its people? Or is it someone unzipping themselves from a one-person horse costume, which just happens to be throwing up on a dead body? These are important questions, which nobody has ever needed to ask. <laughs> so, in the end, we have a tie. Congratulations to the winners, Violet and Emma, and thank you all for playing. <laughs> There's a hundred and four- Cod.